open up to a couple of places, find the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, and then when you get there, turn over to John chapter 10. That's where we'll begin today. John chapter 10. Isaiah 43 and John chapter 10. While you're turning, let me just say to all of our online audience, those of you watching live stream, live stream or YouTube TV, Apple TV, Roku TV, Fire TV, or listening by podcast, however you're listening or watching today, let me tell you, God loves you. He's got a word for you today. Listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say through this message today. John chapter 10 is where I want to begin. And I want to read a very popular scripture here, but I tell you what, I know God is saying this today. John chapter 10, I want to read verse 10. John 10, 10. We're going to read from the New King James Version. There are a lot of good translations, but just for the sake of us reading aloud together, if you'll follow along on the screens or if you're reading from the New King James Bible, let's all read together. John chapter 10 and verse 10, reading loudly and together, let's read. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now let me say it back to you. These are the words of Jesus. Most of you that have a Bible, we would have red letters where Jesus was speaking. And notice what Jesus said. This, Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I really love this verse because it encapsulates the whole motive and agenda between God and the devil. Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. This is the big difference between what Satan wants to do to your life and what God wants to do to your life. Satan wants to bring death and destruction and God wants to bring life and restoration. And Jesus just makes it so plain and so clear. And it'll become all the more clear today as we study God's Word. Now, there are some people, some scholars, that would say, commentators and such, that would say, well, this is really not talking about the devil. This is talking about the Pharisees, the religious leaders and such, because contextually and so on. I've read this context over and over and over, so I realize what they're talking about. However, the Bible says, study, or the New King James says, in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to show yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, the whole Bible is like a big puzzle that must be spiritually connected by the Holy Spirit. In other words, there are, there's truth all over the Bible, and if you have a wrong perspective and a wrong understanding then you'll put the wrong pieces with, with uh, you'll put the square peg in the round hole and you'll try to put the round peg in the square hole and they just don't match. You're connecting the wrong dots, so to speak. But the Bible says that Jesus said the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. And once you begin to read the Bible and study it and to see how it's all interconnected, you'll realize that sometimes when somebody might look at the context, they'll say, oh, that's just talking about that one thing. You'll realize, and I'll show it to you a little later as well, you'll realize, well, wait a minute, it's not just talking about that one thing. In other words, Jesus was not just referring to the Pharisees and the religious rulers here. Jesus is referring to the devil. He's referring to the devil. Let me show you here in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 12, verse 9, John, you remember, had seen the revelation of Jesus Christ, and he, in a vision, he was watching the end of the age happen. And he wrote this whole book that we call the book of Revelation about what's going to happen at the end of the age. And here in the 12th chapter, the ninth verse, he wrote this. So the great dragon was cast out. Okay, who's the great dragon? Well, watch this. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Well, now we know exactly who it is. It's the devil whose name is Satan. But notice it says the great dragon. And then it says that serpent of old. Well, what does that tell us? Well, back in Genesis, you remember the serpent came to Eve. 
and said, did God really say? And I've heard some people say, well, see, it doesn't say devil. It doesn't say Satan in Genesis. So we can't say that that's the devil. We can't say that that's Satan because it doesn't actually say the devil or Satan in Genesis chapter 3. However, in Revelation chapter 12, and I believe also the 19th chapter as well, says the same thing. It said, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So just because it didn't say it in Genesis chapter 3, that doesn't mean the Bible didn't tell us who it is. Amen. The Bible says right there, that serpent of old is called the devil and Satan. So don't let anybody take you. See, context is important. Don't get me wrong. A good student of the Bible studies the context. There's no doubt about that. But don't think that you can't look anywhere else in the Bible because God wrote the whole thing. And God gives clues throughout the whole Bible. So the Bible needs to be interpreted in light of the rest of the Bible because God wrote this whole thing. So notice again, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Who deceives the whole world. What does, what does the devil do? He deceives the whole world. In other words, there are lots of intelligent people around the world that think they've got things figured out, not realizing, oh, they've been deceived. He deceives the whole world. He was cast to earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, who's Christ? Who is Christ? What's his name? Jesus, okay? And the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God, how often? Day and night has been cast down. Well, who is that? That's the dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, Satan. It's all the same person. And the Bible says in this text, he deceives the whole world and he accuses the brethren. All believers, he accuses them. See, this is, this is what the devil will do. He'll deceive you. He'll tempt you. Oh, come over here. It's going to be okay. Ah, oh, don't worry. I, I don't worry that the Bible says not to do that. God understands. He wants you to be happy. Come on over here. That's what he was telling Eve. Oh, you're going to be like God. Oh, it's going to be okay. He deceived her. See, and he deceives people. And then once you come over here and you do wrong and you rebel against the ways of God, then he accuses you, look what you did, look what you did, and condemns you. See, because we can't see the devil, we don't realize it's the same person doing it. Deceives you to sin and get out of alignment with God and then condemns you and accuses you day and night. In other words, he bombards you with these lies and deceptions, this condemnation and such. But Jesus and the Bible is exposing him and saying, hey, that's not God doing that to you. That's the devil doing that to you. Listen to what Jesus said in John 8, 44 about the devil. He said, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's not only a liar, but he's the father of lies. He's the one that inspires the liars. He inspires the liars. And so he's a liar and he's the father of it. Now I want to show you in more practical terms how this played out with the people of God in Exodus chapter 1. You remember that Israel was in Egypt and things were always not great in Egypt, but something changed with a new pharaoh and this new pharaoh is a picture, intentionally a picture of the devil. Watch this. In Exodus 1.8, the Bible says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, talking about the Egyptians, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. And so go up and out of the land. Therefore, watch this, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. They set taskmasters over them. Now, they made them slaves. Taskmaster. 
master. You remember the term from the slave days, even in the United States? There were slaves and then there were the masters. Notice this goes way back to Egypt now. It says that Egypt set taskmasters. Now what's a taskmaster? Well, it says taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. In other words, the Egyptians now have slaves to do their hard work. In other words, yeah, the Egyptians, I mean, the Israelites have to take care of their own families, but now they got to take care of the Egyptians' families. Now they got to do Egypt's work. And so they lost their freedom. They lost all their liberty. They lost their right to live to take care of their own lives and families. Now they're working for somebody else's blessing, somebody else's wealth, somebody else's advancement, somebody else's progress. My whole life is being spent for somebody else. This is the plan of the enemy. This is what the enemy wants to do to you, that you just serve his, his agenda. You just work for him. He puts you under pressure. Notice this other word. It says, therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them, to afflict them. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be flicked than afflicted. <laughs> Would you? Somebody flick you? I don't like being flicked, but I'd rather be flicked than afflicted. Boy, afflicted, what does that mean? That means they, they do not care about how it feels. They do not care. They're not going to talk nice to you. You're not only going to bear their burden and work for their prosperity, but they don't give a rip if you're feeling good today or you're not feeling good today. You got a headache or not? You got a backache or not? You got an upset stomach? So what? I feel like I'm going to throw up. Well, throw up and then get back to work. <laughs> no, really, this is, this is the way it became for the people of God. It's a harshness. It's a harshness. Well, watch this. And they, the children of Israel, built for Pharaoh's supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. So God continued to bless them even though they were under affliction. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. Verse 13. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. With rigor. Now what is rigor? That means that now, instead of just making you work and serve their agenda and you're working under this hard labor now they're coming with the whips and now they're saying faster go move faster run i mean with rigor so now it's not just you lost your liberty it's not just that you're serving under pressure now it's harshness now you're being driven driven to excel driven to work even harder you can imagine how miserable this was Verse 14, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve with, was with rigor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives of whom was the name Shifra and the other name Pua, and he said to these midwives, when you do the duty of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and you see them on the birth stools. If it is a son, you shall kill it. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. So now he's going a step farther, this Pharaoh. I'm telling you, this is the devil. And I'm not saying that man physically was the devil, but he was inspired by the devil because this is the way the devil treats people. He said, not only are we forcing them to be in what is called today the rat race, the rat race under pressure, just serving money. I got to work, I got to work, I got to work. I got to go, 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 go. Why? I'm in debt. I got bills to pay. I got to keep going. I got to pr pressure myself. But not only that, but now notice he's coming to kill the babies. He tells the Hebrew midwives, hey, listen, if it's a baby boy, the moment that baby comes out, if you see it's a boy, just kill it before the mother even knows what's going on. And then just tell the mother, I don't know what happened. I don't, I don't know what happened. You kill every baby boy. Can you imagine that? Hey, that's the spirit of the age today. This is what the devil is doing today to the people of God. This is what the devil, this is the spirit of the age. You can see this happening and playing out again today. The, the enemy wanting to kill the babies. To kill the babies. But I want you to see what Jesus 
something that happened with Jesus in Luke 13. And you'll see again the devil behind what's going on. In Luke 13, verse 10, the Bible says, Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. And infirmity means a weakness. But notice it didn't just say she had an infirmity 18 years. It said she had a spirit of infirmity. In other words, behind this weakness in her body, behind this ailment that she had, there was an evil spirit causing it. And see, this lady no doubt had no idea this is, has anything to do with something spiritual. She just thought she was having a problem with her back. But notice this, the Bible says she had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. So here she is, she's got this back problem, and she's bent over, but she can't raise herself up. 18 years she's been like that. So notice this, but when Jesus saw her, oh, I love that. I love that. But when Jesus saw her, see, I, the, the thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, look at this, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now watch this. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Jesus didn't like that. Watch this. Then the Lord answered him and said, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? He said, Jesus said, you're being a hypocrite because on the Sabbath day when people are not supposed to work, you'll go see your ox or your donkey that needs water. You'll go untie it from where it's tied. You'll lead it to get some water and then you'll take it back. He said, and here's a woman that has been bound for 18 years and you don't want her to be free? You're, you're going to treat the animal better than a woman? See, Jesus called him right out on it, didn't he? Jesus called him right out on it. But look, look at how interesting this is. Verse, eight, verse 16. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, what does that mean? She's in covenant with God. She's Jewish. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it. For 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. Notice Jesus just exposed this whole thing and said, she doesn't just have a back problem. Satan bound her. Well, I believe it's rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, well, I don't care what you call it, but Jesus said, listen, Satan bound her. Well, I, I thought maybe she had an injury. Well, whatever, Jesus said Satan bound her. In other words, Jesus is exposing something that behind many of the problems that people are dealing with that they think are just normal, natural problems is a spirit that has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And that spirit has stolen her health. That spirit has destroyed her ability to live a full life. Is, can you, how many of you can see this? See, this is stealing and killing and destroying going on. And Jesus is exposing this and saying, look, the thief does not come except to do that, but I came to give this lady her life back. I came to bring health and healing to this lady. How many of you can see that? See, this is exactly John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came and gave this lady her life back. And she stood up straight, holding her head up high, she doesn't have pain in her back, and she's able to be mobile and to do what she wants to do. But Jesus said, look, you religious people would have left her bound. You've been doing that 18 years. And I've come today say, no, we're not waiting another day. The religious, come back tomorrow. Today's the Sabbath. Jesus said, no, we're not waiting another day. We waited 18 years too long. Amen. Jesus is speaking to somebody today. 
saying, I know it's been years, but today is your day. Today is your day to be loosed. Today is your day to be free. Today is your day to be healed. Praise God. All right, now watch this. In Ephesians 6, 12, the apostle Paul told us, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, Satan wants to deceive us into thinking that everything is circumstantial. That everything is, well, well it's because, you know, my job, and it's because of my husband or my wife, it's because of my boss, it's because of what I did in the past, and that, I'm just reaping the consequence of it, not realizing, yeah, but Satan was the one deceiving you to do that in the past. So even the sins that have been committed, yeah, you're responsible for them because you did them. But God also sees what you didn't see. The devil was tripping you up, deceiving you, luring you to do it. And so it wasn't just you on your own. That doesn't mean you're not responsible to confess it and to receive forgiveness before the Lord because you are. But you shouldn't let him accuse you and condemn you to stay in that situation that he led you into. We should let God forgive us and deliver us from these things. Can somebody say amen to this? Amen. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. So Paul is saying, listen, we're not just dealing with natural things here. We're dealing with spiritual things. And we have to engage these wicked spirits just like Jesus did. Satan has bound this woman. We're not going to let him do that anymore. Not another day. Today she gets set free. And that's the way we ought to be. I'm not letting Satan do that to me anymore. I declare from this day forward I shall be free. I'm going to walk in the ways of the Lord, the ways of healing and such. Do you remember the Apostle Paul when God first met him, when God, Jesus first confronted him on the road to Damascus? His name back then was Saul. And then eventually he was called Paul. But it says in Acts 26, I won't take the time to read the whole passage, but Jesus was speaking to him and telling him what he had called him to do, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But he said this in Acts 26, 17, I will deliver you from the Jewish people, because they were going to be persecuting him, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes. I'm sending you, Saul, Paul, to open the eyes of the Gentiles in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. I'm calling you to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So notice, Jesus is telling Paul, all these Gentiles, these non-Jews out here that ha don't have covenant with God, Satan, the power of Satan is controlling them. And I've called you to go preach the gospel about Jesus to them and deliver them from the power of Satan to be children of God. And what will happen when they're children of God? Notice this. From the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He said, I not only want to deliver them from the power of Satan, but I want to forgive them from their sins and I want to give them an inheritance among the family of God. See, Jesus is a good Lord, isn't he? Jesus is a good Lord. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 about the devil. He said, whose minds the God of this age, that's the devil, the God of this age has blinded whose minds. Notice it didn't say he blinded their eyes. It said he blinded their minds. It didn't say he blinded their eyes. It said he blinded their minds. How many of you ever talked to somebody about a, having a blind spot? We know there's a blind spot with, with driving a car and the mirrors don't see everything. But how many of you have talked to somebody about maybe the fact that they have a blind spot? How many of you had somebody talk to you about a blind spot that you have? And you'll say, no, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. Well, of course, if, if it's a blind spot, you wouldn't see it. You'd have to trust somebody to point it out to you. Well, the Bible is saying here that this is what Satan has done. He's blinded the minds of people to where they think they're seeing clearly, but they're not. They think they have the right perspective, but they don't because he's deceived them and he's given them what they think 
is an intelligent perspective, but it's not. It's a perspective that's skewed. It's a perspective with lies and deception woven into to them. So it says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light. In other words, they don't believe. Otherwise, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Should shine on them. There are so many people in this situation today, both believers and unbelievers. There are so many people today who are discouraged. Oh, discouragement is rampant today. So many people are discouraged. Just don't believe that their situation is going to change. So many people are depressed. Suicide is on the rise. Suicide is on the rise. You know, we're, we're living in what the news tells us is a good economy. The stock market continues to break records. Did you know that? The st just this week, the stock market has broken more records again. Again. In just the last couple of years, I think I, I heard on the news, just the last couple of years, the stock market has broken over 100 records in the last two years. Unemployment is way down at historic lows. And yet, the suicide rate is up. What is going on? Folks, this is not just natural, this is spiritual. This is not just natural, this is spiritual. The God of this age has blinded minds. The God of this age is putting pressure on people. The God of this age is bringing fear and hopelessness to people. And people are feeling like they have no way out but to commit suicide. It's not true, it's a lie, but that's the way a lot of people are feeling. So many people disillusioned, disillusioned. There are so many people in fear, so many people in bondage to sins, in bondage to pornography. The statistics are staggering as to how many people are bound with pornography. Statistically speaking, there'd be a large percentage in this room bound with pornography. And most, most of you'd be embarrassed about it. There might be a few of you that wouldn't be ashamed. You're thinking, well, a lot of people do that. Shouldn't be ashamed of it. No, it is shameful. It is shameful. It's not natural. It's not normal. It's not appropriate. It's not the way God created us. But let me tell you something. It's not just a physiological addiction. It's not just a mental addiction. It's not just a psychological addiction either. This is spiritual. These perverse spirits drive people. That's why you feel like, you know, you, you, you feel like everything's okay and maybe you're not going to do it anymore. And then all of a sudden, you get into a certain situation. Maybe you see an opportunity or you're by yourself and all of a sudden you can sense it. I, I remember being in bondage to lust. And I remember in certain situations I'd feel, I'd beg God, I, I don't want this anymore. I don't want any part of that anymore. But I'd be in certain situations, often by myself, and you could feel something come over you. You could feel it. And it's like in your mind, you go, oh, here it comes. Oh, here it comes. I didn't recognize it was an evil spirit back then, but I knew something. Oh, I knew something. See, now I realize, oh, that was a spirit. That was a spirit that was doing that. And that thing comes over you, and you know before anything happens what, where this is going and what's about to happen, what you're about to do. Oh, yeah, these are evil spirits. And they're working, they're working on people today, just like in Egypt, afflicting them with rigor, pressuring them, luring them to do this. And then the moment they do, condemning them, accusing them. This is the devil. Oh, this is the devil. This is the demonic realm. Bondages, drug addictions, alcohol addictions, smoking addiction, anything to kill you, anything to destroy you, fast or slow. If he can't destroy you fast, he'll destroy you slow. Isn't that right? Eating addiction. Oh, yeah, the enemy is trying any way, fast or slow, to kill, to destroy. People under financial pressure. Debt, debt, yeah, debt. The enemy drives us. I'm not saying it's always bad to borrow or to have credit, but the enemy drives us. Don't wait. Just do it on credit. Just do a little more, a little more, and before you know it, then you're under this weight, and then he adds weight to you, adds weight to you. I believe with all my heart the enemy will add to people that are under financial pressure more fees, 
more late fees. I mean, just never get a break. Oh, yeah, that we watched that in Egypt. This is the same spirit. And it's happening today. We're watching it happen. We're watching it happen in our society. People that are sick, people that are weary, people that are hopeless, people that are lost, people that are lonely, people that are going nowhere. I mean, they're working, working, they're spending their 24 hours a day, but they look back and thinking, am I making any progress? Making no progress, and some people wouldn't even know if they were making progress because they don't even know what direction they're supposed to go. They're just keeping things afloat. Keep it. I remember I used to work at the grocery store, you know, and sometimes, you know, when I was checking groceries, you know, you say hi to people, and you, say, and you just ask them, you know, small talk, say, hey, how are you doing today? And I remember this guy, still kicking. <laughs> and every time he came in, he'd say the same thing, still kicking. Or some people say, I say, how are you doing today? So far, so good. <laughs> I mean, that, that almost says, but I'm expecting something bad anytime, right? No, no, but people, I mean, just barely making it, barely surviving. And their whole way of thinking is like that. This is, the, this is what the enemy does to people. Directionless. Lost all confidence that they could really do something and make a difference in this world. The highest calling, of course, is to be who you're called to be. Who you were designed to be. The devil doesn't even want you to know that that exists. And yet you have this high, ultimate, divine design and calling from God. And this is why Jesus hates that, what the devil does to people. That's why he said, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came, but I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. I came. You know, when Jesus first started his ministry, he went to Nazareth, and he opened up the scroll. He found the place in Isaiah where it prophesied about himself, and he began to read this, and in Luke 4, 18, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He said, that's why I'm here. I'm here to declare that everything the devil has done against you, that, that's over. I'm doing something new in you. I'm starting something fresh. I'm releasing you from that. See, just like that woman that was bent over. Jesus said, I came to reverse what the devil has been doing. And let me just tell you, Jesus is a better savior than the devil is an enemy. Jesus is a more powerful healer than the devil is to make somebody sick. Amen. Jesus is a better provider than the devil is to put somebody under debt. So as strong as you think the devil's work is, just, just know this, Jesus' work is much stronger. Much stronger. He'll break the back of the devil. He'll break all of that. Just reverse it. He's not afraid of the devil. Jesus is not afraid of the devil. No, he's come to re reverse it. <clears throat> in fact, listen to this in Acts chapter 10, the 38th verse. Peter, Jesus' number one disciple, was talking about Jesus. And he said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Jesus went about doing good and Jesus went about healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Jesus knew the devil had oppressed people with sicknesses. The devil had oppressed people. It wasn't just hereditary. You know, we like to try to figure out, well, it's just hereditary, it runs, it runs in my family. Yeah, but did you know evil spirits stay around certain families just to keep that stuff going, too? I'm not saying there is no truth to uh, DNA and physio physiology that passes down. What I am saying is Jesus created the DNA. He can repair it. But the devil will tell you, no, nope, no, it's part of your family. That's just the way it is. And that's a lie. I said that's a lie. The God who created our bodies can fix them. And Jesus did that in the earth, didn't he? 
Jesus did that in the earth. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, who went about doing good and healing all, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Don't you love that? Not healing some who were oppressed by the devil. Healing all. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Jesus came to heal everybody. I said Jesus came to heal everybody. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Look at this. In 1 John 3, 8, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Now watch this. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. What does that mean? This is why he showed up, to destroy the works of the devil. Well, we heard him say that in John 10, 10. The thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I came to reverse what the devil is doing. For this reason, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Jesus said, this is why I came, to destroy the works of the devil on your life. All that hard affliction, bondage, the pressure he's putting on you, all the things that he's doing against you, driving you, condemning you, tempting you, he said, yeah, I came to destroy all of that. For this reason, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And this is real. This is real. This is why Jesus came. And on the cross, in his weakness, Jesus intentionally, willingly becoming weak on the cross to die for our sins, in that weakness, he broke the power of, of the devil. Why is that? Because the devil's saying, you can't heal them. They sin. They sin. And Jesus said, I'm paying for their sin right now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can't provide for them. You can't provide. No, you can't get them out of debt because look at the sin in their life. He said, yeah, I'm paying for their sin right now. See, Jesus humbled himself and paid so that now you no longer owe anybody anything. You are covered, you are paid for, you belong to God, and he bought you the right to have all of his blessing, all of his salvation, all of his restoration. Is that right? See, so Jesus came to reverse all of that, took the payment and everything. Now, I ask you to turn to Isaiah 43. Let's take a look at it, because this is the word of the Lord. This is what God's saying. Jesus came back some 2,000 years ago, and guess what? He's coming today. He has a word for you today. Here's the word. Isaiah 43, 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Notice again. Do not remember the former things. Somebody said, well, I've been struggling for a while. He said, yeah, forget about it. Don't you remember that last season? Because that last season is not how the next season is going to be for you. Why? Because I'm coming to do something new. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old, nor consider. Don't even consider the way it used to be. Why? Behold, I will do a new thing. Now, what does behold mean? What does behold mean? That means, I want you to see this. You may not look at your circumstances and see any change, but the Lord is saying, I'm telling you, I am bringing some change right now. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now, we know this prophecy was originally given to and about Israel. We know that to be true, but we also know that these prophecies are also used by the Holy Spirit to speak to different individuals over the course of time. So we don't in any way dispute the original authorship of Isaiah, the prophet, uh, and really the Holy Spirit through Isaiah, nor the original recipients, the people of God back in that day. And it's really true. But let me tell you, I know the Lord is saying this today. I know the Lord is saying this today to this church, that the Lord is saying the enemy has oppressed you long enough, and I am coming to do something new. 
I am coming to change that, to destroy the works of the devil, to get you out from under those bondage, to let you get out from under those burdens that the devil's got you under, and let you stand up straight like that woman. Have your life back again. Have your freedom back again. And so the Lord says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, see this, I will do a new thing. Notice it didn't say, try something new. No, he didn't say, you're going to do the new thing. God says, no, I'm doing the new thing. I'm doing the new thing. I will do a new thing. Now watch this. Now it shall spring forth. Now it shall spring forth. What is that doing? That's answering a lie in your mind. What lie is that? That's a lie. It's like, yeah, you know, I've been praying for this a long time, though. Well, now it shall spring forth. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I was hoping it would happen last year, but it didn't happen last year. Well, now it shall spring forth. Amen. You see what God's doing? God's saying, but now it will. But now it will. Yeah, but I, I thought it would last. Yeah, but now it will. Yeah, but now it will. Now it will. See, our minds will talk us out of what God wants to do. And he said, don't let your mind talk you out of it. I'm telling you right now. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? What does that mean? That means this is not just some blessing that's going to happen in the spirit realm that you'll never see with your eyes or experience. He said, no, you'll know it. You'll know it. When it comes, you'll know it. You'll know it. You, you know, some young person says, Mom, how do, I, how do you know when you're in love? What does she say? You'll know. Isn't that right? And this is what the Lord's saying. The Lord's saying, when it shows up, you'll know it showed up. It's not going to be just, a, it's not going to be a mystery. It's going to be evident and obvious, tangible. It's going to really come to pass. It's not just a figment of your imagination or just a hope and a dream. He said, shall you not know it? Now watch this last part. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I will even make a road in the wilderness. What does that mean? That means, see, in the wilderness and out in the desert, there's, there's not a road out there. In other words, you're out in no man's land. In other words, he said, you're out in a place where you look every direction and you see no way out. I, I see no way out of debt. I see no way to get healed of this sickness. I see no way to have my relationship that I've longed for fulfilled. I have no way to see this marriage restored. I have no way to have my heart that's been so discouraged to be full of joy. I, I, have no, I don't know what to do. I've tried this and that and the other. I don't know what to do. You're in a wilderness. You're in a desert. And God says, yeah, but that's not an issue for me because, listen, I will even make a road in the wilderness. I'll make a road. He didn't say, I'll, I'll show you where a road is. No, no, no. I will make one. Well, wait a minute. If you're going to make a road, that means you get to decide where that road's going to be. Isn't that right? If you're going to make the road, you have to decide where the road's going to be. So what is God saying? God's saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making the road right to you. Where? In the wilderness. I'm bringing the road to you. So you're going to turn around, you're going to say, oh, where'd that road come from? <laughs> like, all of a sudden, there's a road. There has been no way out. And all of a sudden, there's a road. God said, yeah, I made the road. And I brought that road, I built it right to you where you are. To get to you. Why? To get you out of here. I don't know, have, have you ever, have you ever... Amen. Have you ever walked in sand? You know, you go to the beach or whatever, and it's all right to walk in for a while, but have you ever tried to walk a long way in sand? A lot of your energy is spent digging down into the sand. In other words, you, you don't make the progress that you make. And the Lord said, no, no, no. I'm not going to make you walk out of this desert in the sand. I'm building a road. Once you step up on this road, you realize, oh, man, like, I'm moving now. My energy is getting me down the road now. In fact, let me just tell you something. It's even better than that. It's like those, those you know, those people movers at the airport? You know, you step on those. It's like an escalator, but it's flat. 
You know what I'm talking about? And you step on that, you know, you're walking along, and then you step onto that, and you're like, woo, yeah, there you go, you know. In fact, they, they warn you when you're about to come to the end because you notice, you know, you hit that, that part where it slows you down. If you're not paying attention, you can fall down. But uh, this is the way it is in the Lord. The Lord is saying, yeah, I'm, I'm bringing the road to you. When you step on this road, you're going to realize that the power of God is accelerating you, and you're moving along down the road. Now, now here's the question. But where are you going? You're going out of the wilderness. God said, I'm bringing the road to you to get you out of that spot that it didn't look like you'd ever get out of. I'm building a road right to you to get you out of that. But notice, he didn't only say a road. He said, I will even make a road in the wilderness and, watch this, rivers in the desert. Rivers in the desert. You know, it wasn't too many weeks ago, we did a whole series called Rivers of Living Water. Notice, not a river, rivers. I will even make a road, one road in the wilderness, and rivers in the desert, plural, plural, rivers. Jesus said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Not just a river, rivers of living water. And we talked about how the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, all these gifts of the Spirit, are rivers of the Holy Spirit that he wants to bring about. And this is what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying, I'm not just bringing a road, a dusty road to you to go, but you're still just, you know, just dry and parched and dehydrated and everything. He said, uh-uh. I'm bringing a road to you, and they're going to be rivers. So you walk a little way and just be refreshed by the river. Just walk a little way, be refreshed. Never get dehydrated again. No, you're going to have rivers, rivers, refreshing restoration, and if you get hungry, you can fish in the river. Amen? Somebody said, I don't like fish. Well, then catch a steak out of that river. <laughs> this is a miracle river. <laughs> the Lord's saying, no, listen, I'm going to provide everything you need. Everything the devil has done, I'm reversing that. I'm reversing that. Thank God. Let me tell you, this, this is the word of the Lord. This is what he's saying. I am doing that. I am doing a new thing, a new thing, a new thing, a new thing. Now, what do we do? Well, we got to step up onto that road. How do you do it? You do it by following what Jesus tells you to do. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 9, you remember he came to Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said, follow me, follow me. And he arose and followed him, follow me. In John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And this is what I did way back when I was bound. The enemy had me all tangled up in sin and lust and everything, and those evil spirits were just beat, beating on me, accusing me, condemning me, telling me you'll never be delivered, you'll never be free. They were lies, but I'm telling you, they, they felt so real. I felt like I can't get free from this sexual addiction. I can't get free from this bondage. And the, the devil was accusing me. See, look at you. You never amount to anything. You're going to be embarrassed. You're going to be exposed one day. Even when you do get married, your marriage will fall apart because of this. I mean, just lies. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Discouraging, discouraging. And I just kept going to Jesus. Tell me what to do. And Jesus led me to this book and I began to consume his word. Oh, you remember what he said in John 8, 31 and 32? He said, if you abide in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. And so I just kept going back to this word. And I'm telling you, God opened my eyes to this book. And I began to consume it. And I'm telling you, that bondage broke. And all the condemnation left with it. Not only was I delivered from those spirits of lust and bondage and, and all the physiological things that went along with that, psychological. Let me tell you, you don't have to understand to be set free. Somebody said, well, I got to read enough books. Okay, you can read all the books you want to, but it's not understanding what all is going on that's going to make you free. It's the power of God that makes you free through the Word of God. 
If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I didn't have to understand all the implications of it. I needed to understand who I was in Christ. I needed to understand the truth about God, about myself, about the devil, about my authority over him, et cetera, et cetera. And when I knew the truth, boy, I tell you what, the power of those evil spirits was broken off my life. And not only that, but I'm telling you, he cleansed me from all the guilt and condemnation. That's why I can stand up here just regularly, stand in front of thousands of people and just tell them I used to be bound and everything. I have no shame. I'm not saying it was right. I was ashamed back then. But see, I'm not bound anymore. I don't need to be ashamed. I get to stand up and give my testimony and tell everybody else that's bound. You don't have to be bound. Jesus set me free and he'll set you free. He came to destroy the works of the devil. See, so, so it gives me great uh, pleasure to be able to share what Jesus did in my life because ever since I started sharing it, other people have been set free. And deliver. See, that's why I keep talking about it. But you'll notice I'm not ashamed to talk about it. Why? I'm delivered. I'm free. That's not me anymore. Oh, that's so 30 years ago. You understand what I'm talking about? See, and that's what God wants for you too. You keep coming around here. You keep hanging around here. The Lord's going to deliver you too. He's going to break the power. Boy, he hates the works of the devil. And Jesus will reverse every bit of it. Jesus will reverse every bit of it. Amen. Isn't God good? Let me, let me tell you what's happening. So we're starting this series here that I've called The Way Up and Out. I'll even make a road in the wilderness. God came to get you up, away from the, uh, out of the miry clay, out of that bondage, but he also came to get you out of that wilderness, out of that desert place. Thank God. So we're starting this, and we're going to sit on this next week. I want you to hear how this all came about, how the Lord unfolded this whole thing. Next week, we'll share this. But let me tell you, this is going to lead us to the Christmas services. Because what we're all going to do, you're going to take those Christmas invitations, we're going to invite people to come in. And the Lord's going to talk to these people about his love for them. And about how these things have happened to them. And how there's an evil spirit that will do these things. But how Jesus came to give them life. How Jesus came to destroy those things off of their life and to give their life back. And he'll even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So at our Christmas services, I'm going to share from this passage that the Lord is building a road right to that person. You're going to invite some people to come. And you may think, oh, I don't think they'll ever give their life to the Lord. But when they sit there and God begins to explain to them, I'm making a road right to you because I love you and I don't want that happening in your life. You're going you're gonna to see hearts are going to melt. Oh, we've seen it happen so many times. Hearts are going to melt and they're going to know, oh, God's talking to me. God's talking to me and they're going to give their lives to the Lord Jesus. And then they're going to follow him into discipleship. And that's exactly what we're going to do as well because the Lord's going to be offering discipleship. We're going to have not only OSL and level one and all that, but we're also going to have discipleship for marriages that need uh, strengthening, for finances, for health, for parenting, for people that have been addicted. We're going to have all kinds of discipleship all built on God's word. All built on God's word. See, and people are going to get delivered. And so this is, what, this is what's happening. Yes, we're all following the Lord, and we're going to get on the road that gets us out of whatever we're in, brings us up from whatever pushing us down. Isn't that right? But we've got a few weeks here to invite some people to come. Those Christmas invitations are for us to begin to invite people and to tell them about our Christmas services. And at our Christmas services, this is what the Lord is going to offer to people. He's saying, I'm making a road right to you. I'm bringing a road to get you out of that situation. I'm telling you, people that have never heard God speak to them in their lives, in this place, they will hear God speak. Just like you're hearing God speak. God's going to speak to their hearts. And they're, gonna, they're just going to know, man, is that God? Like, I feel like God's talking to me right now. And he will be. He will be. So this is what we're doing. We're receiving this word for ourselves, but we're also gearing up to invite people to come and to allow them to hear. You remember what? Jesus told Paul, he said, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to deliver them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, 
and to forgive their sins and to give them an inheritance. To give them an inheritance. And that's exactly what we're being sent to do. We're being sent to invite some people and say, ah, I don't know if I want to invite people. You do. You do. Why? Because you're a believer in Jesus and you care about those people. You care more about them than you care about what they think about you. You care about them and you want them to hear what God is saying so they can receive the love of the Lord and be changed and have these dark spirits and these wicked agendas broken off of their lives. That's why you will, because you want that for them. And there's, there's just no comfortable way to, to win the world to Jesus. We're going to have to put ourselves out there, step a little out of, out of our comfort zone, and invite them to come, and let them hear God. Let them hear God. The voice of the Lord is powerful. When God speaks to you, oh man, it impacts you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Oh, let me tell you, you're impacted when you know some of you are hearing God today. In fact, a whole lot of you are hearing God today. So anyway, that's the plan. We're going to walk this through, be here all, every weekend and soak this in, and then be inviting people to come to those Christmas services, and we'll really gear toward them. We're not going to be real religious or anything, uh, because we really want to gear toward the people. Paul said, to the Jew, I become as a Jew, to win the Jews. To those who are Greeks, I become like a Greek person, to win the Greek people. And in the same way, we want to become like somebody who's unchurched and more like unbelievers. And so uh, I want to relate to them with some humor and so on. But most of all, I want them to hear the voice of God. And so people are going to come to the Lord like crazy that day. People that they thought, I'm just coming because my friend invited me. And they're going to be sitting there and they're going to know, my God's talking to me right now. <laughs> oh, you watch it. We've seen it happen so many times. God is good. Now let's get back to you. God's talking to you today. Some of you have been in a situation for a long time, and the Lord's saying, forget about it. Don't remember the former things. Let it go. Let the last season go. I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. How many of you will allow the Lord to do a new thing? Come on, raise your hand if you'll allow the Lord to do a new thing. Amen. Praise God. Come on, let's stand right now. Don't leave. Don't leave. I'm trusting you to stand without leaving, okay? <laughs> No, sometimes you say it, but people still leave. All right, now listen. Let's come before the Lord right now. Come on, lift a hand to the Lord and say, Lord, I hear you speaking today. Building a road right to me. You said not to remember the old things because you're doing a new thing. I'm inviting you right now. Do your new thing, Lord. I welcome your new thing. Get me out of this situation. Take me up higher. Take me on out. I believe you're powerful enough. I believe you're wise enough. You know what you're doing. I trust you, Lord. I accept your proposal. I'm coming out. You know what I just thought about? Uh, we're moving on up. Uh, I know that's not a gospel song, but... How many of you know the Lord's saying, I'm taking you up? Come on. Praise God. Amen. I think I, think I just dated myself, didn't I? Did I? Some of the young ones are saying, what? What's that? What's that? What's that? Oh, well, it's a new pop song that's out. You'll hear about it. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding you. No, God's doing a good thing. God's doing a good thing. God's doing a new thing. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God is a good God. God is a good God, and yes, it is going to happen for you. That lie in your mind that says, well, it's probably not going to happen for me. The Lord says, yes, it is going to happen for you. Begin to be excited about it. Yeah, somebody said, well, I don't want to get my hopes up. The Lord's saying, get your hopes up. Get your hopes up. That's called faith. Get your hopes up. That's called faith. God is real. And let me tell you, God hates what the devil is doing. Jesus said, I came to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Come on, let's tell the Lord, Lord, go ahead and destroy all the works of the devil in my life. Destroy all the works of the devil in my life. I don't want any of his works around. 
Lord, I want what you're doing. I want, what, I want your will to be done in my life. Praise God. So, Lord, I thank you. Sicknesses are destroyed in Jesus' name. Weaknesses are destroyed. Debts. Lord, I, I declare that the spirits behind the bondage of debt, we know we're responsible for a lot of these things, if not all of them, but in Jesus' name, those spirits that are driving more and more debt, fees, late fees, com compiling that interest in the name of Jesus, Lord, reverse all of that. Reverse all of that. Lord, we thank you for supernatural debt removal in the name of Jesus. Not that we're absolving ourselves from, from responsibility, no. Lord, we want you to strengthen us to do right with our money, to be good stewards. We want to grow in that too. But Lord, we need some help with these burdens that are on the people of God. So in Jesus' name, we thank you for getting us out of debt, getting us out of there, There's some folks in here. Oh, I didn't say this in any of the services. There's some folks in here, and the Lord's saying to you, you normally go into a lot of debt here at Christmas, but I want you to listen to me and let me show you some wisdom because the devil would like to drive you into more debt here at Christmas. But if you'll listen to me, the Lord says, I'm going to whisper to you and show you this and that and the other and show you how to go through Christmas blessed and blessing other people and yet not go into all that debt that you normally go into. And the, and the Lord's saying, some of you, the devil will put guilt on you because you bought something really nice but didn't spend enough. You think, well, I have to spend a lot. And the Lord's saying, but I'm blessing you and showing you how to give nice things without spending so much. The Lord's saying, listen to me. Let me show you the way out. Don't listen to the devil. Don't listen to your history. Forget the past. Let me show you how to do this, says the Lord. And I'll, I'll show you, you'll be on your way out. Even through Christmas, you'll be on your way out. Even through Christmas, you'll be on your way out. Boy, thank God. How many of you received this word? Well, I trust that you heard the Lord speak to you. Isn't it amazing how God can speak to us in any way, at any time, and knows just what to say? Hey, for more resources, for more information, you can always go to jerrydermon.com. And when you do, don't forget to subscribe to our brand new Solid Lives magazine. This is filled with articles that will strengthen you and events to build your faith. And so we just want to get to you as much as possible to be able to help you to be the person that God has called you to be. God bless you and have a great day.